Hey guys, what's up? Eddie Alho here with KissAnalog.com. Hey, today I want to uh, kind of wrap up the RC filter, the single order filter, and um, you know this little video series was an important one because we introduced log, why we use that, and the reason why again was that it makes little small things and big things easy to see detail in both versus a big thing making the little thing so small that you can't see it. So good reason to use log. It makes plotting body plots and so on really easy once you kind of get the hang of it. And we covered RC filters, a uh, real basic filter that we use a lot. And we did the high pass and low pass, just you know basic concepts, uh, kind of show how to use graphs, and which is great because it's it's great to get the concepts down because eventually we're going to see uh, second order filters, LC filters. That's what we use on the output of switching power supplies to smooth them off. We use them in audio amplifiers. Um, we use them in EMI filters. So LC filters are a big deal. So first we wanted to introduce the RC filter just so you can get a, a feel for that. Now LC filters will become easy. Basically for every order of a filter when you draw your graph you find the break point the same way um, when x of c is equal to x of l that's your break point or your resonant point and your resonant point reason they didn't call it resonant is because the minus 90 degree of the capacitor and the plus 90 degree of the uh, inductor cancel so you get zero impedance so you don't get quite zero because you get zero reactants I, you know theoretically but you get your your resistance is still there your DC resistance or your ESR in a capacitor the DC resistance and in inductor so that's the other thing we saw in this video is we saw that our graphs weren't perfect because of these parasitics which is why I used kind of a poor capacitor um, anyway it was a great thing to do today I'm going to show a little bit better capacitor how we can improve that uh, low pass because the low pass is one where we had the capacitor where we're taking the signal off of and the resistor feeding the capacitor right and so as the capacitor low frequencies uh, passed all the signal on except for what was dropped through the resistor that's the non-ideal part of the RC filter otherwise the gain is you know output divided by input is one because they're equal ideally they are there's some loss but ideally they're one and so the log of one you know so is zero so zero dBs is is kind of where your um, your pass band is okay and then the attenuation band is 20 dB per decade for a single order RC or LR filter for that matter uh, and you got it it's whenever L is equal to R that's a break point so it's the same as a capacitor no biggie and so what we're going to be moving on to is LC filters, uh, second order filters. Uh, you get one order from the capacitor, one order from the inductor. Okay, so it's 40 dB per decade. And it's instead of minus 3 dB point, it's going to be the 6 dB point. Okay, so all right, so a lot of good concepts. Parasitics, let's talk about that real quick. Um, parasitics. All components have parasitics. You know, big old resistor like this, this load resistor. If you're trying to simulate a speaker load, you want eight ohms resistance, just ideal, you know, speaker kind of uh, simulation. Well, you don't want your resistor doing its own funky thing, showing you some inductance and capacitance or whatever. So this is a supposedly a non-inductive resistor. It does have some inductance at higher frequencies. It's hard to get away from it. But what they do is they wrap the coil around one way and then they wrap it around the opposite way and those two fields cancel. So, you know, they try to make it non-inductive. Non then there's other wire wound resistors. This is a big one. But, you know, there's small, smaller resistors and they're going to be inductive. So if you don't want inductance in a one watt resistor, let's say don't choose wire wound, use a metal film or metal oxide. That's a good one. Carbon. Uh, metal oxides kind of replace carbon resistors, but those are the kind of resistors you want if you're in a one, two, three watt, you know, category, or get a non-inductive wire wound um, if, you, if you can't have inductance. With inductors, 
you have um, resistance in them. That's, that's a parasitic. That's something that makes it non-ideal. It's DC resistance, okay? There's another thing called AC resistance. See the wire here, it's flat. And so uh, what happens at high frequencies, um, current starts to want to travel on the outside, the surface of the wire, and that's called skin effect. When it does that, it's not using the core of the wire, so it's wasted copper. So if you make it flat, or a whole bunch of strands of copper, small strands, that's a way to um, increase your surface area and drop your AC resistance, so parasitics. The, this is an air core, it's actually plastic in there, plastic core, <laughs> but it's air core. There's no magnetic material, no ferrite, and so you don't have those kind of parasitics, you know, those kind of uh, things changing characteristics or frequency, but you do have these other things, so um, you have that, and with the capacitor, you know, you got a poly cap, this big old X2 safety rated type cap. Uh, that's a foil cap, and that's metal foil. So that is uh, what I call a solid or dry capacitor. That does not dry out. I've heard some people think poly caps or all capacitors dry out, but they don't. Um, the aluminum electrolytic is the cap that dries out. It's really, it might be the only cap that dries out. I'm trying to think of another cap that would. Uh, it has an electrolyte in it, so it dries out. The day it's made, it's starting to dry out, even before you put power on it. Just breathes, dries out. Now, there is another electrolytic type capacitor, and that's a tantalum, right? And we call them wet slugs. Uh, they're solid ones, they don't dry out. There's wet slug ones, you might think they dry out like these. They don't. They're hermetically sealed. So um, there's nothing to, you know, moisture cannot escape unless, unless they're filled. But anyway, aluminum electrolytes. That's why aluminum, aluminum electrolytics are the capacitor that you see on YouTube. You know, guys are replacing these all the times because over the years they just dry out. So you want to choose a good quality one if you're putting it in something you know you want to last a long time and anyway parasitics there's ESR there's ESL there's inductance pretty much inductance in any kind of thing that has leads because you know it's hard to get away from some resistance or some inductance and so you have those things you also have a parallel resistor because you know, if you charge this up, sit on the shelf, it just doesn't sit there and stay charged forever. It leaks. And so one way to show that leakage is just show a parallel resistor. I'm going to show you the symbol of, of a capacitor with those parasitics, just to kind of give you the schematic symbol. And, you know, anyway. So, hey, let's just jump in this video. I'm going to show you a low pass what we saw before, I'm going to show you it with an approved capacitor, and I'm going to show you how you can use a meter like this, an LCR meter, to get, because this has uh, what, five different frequencies, I think five or six different frequencies on it, and so you can pretty much plot your curve with a meter like this. You don't need a fancy GWN stick that has, you know, a way to do Boldy plots. Um, Siglance for channel scopes do Boldy plots as well, so I think you can, I'm not sure if they have the, you know, this has the application, the FRA, Frequency Response Analysis application, but I think any kind of scope that will do a Boldy plot will plot uh, FRA, you know. And so it's good to, to look at your individual components to see how they behave or frequency. So we're gonna take a, uh, I think we're gonna take, maybe we'll take this capacitor here and look at that. And it'll be more ideal because, Think about this aluminum electrolytic. It's large microfarads, 6,800 microfarads. So it starts to, the curve starts to attenuate at a low frequency. By the time the ductance uh, reactant starts to kick in and equalize that capacitive reactance, so the capacitive reactance is dropping and with frequency and inductance is gonna increase. But by time those things meet each other, it could be, you know, way down the band. So what would what's happening is this guy's dropping down hint the ESR and then kind of sitting there until it hits the ESL and then goes up. Okay, um, with a capacitor like this, 
it's one microfarad so it's going to start rolling off a little higher frequency and it might hit the ESL and I think it will. Often you'll see a resonant frequency right around a megahertz. So let's go see what we find, okay? And let's do it. All right, thanks guys. All right guys, this is the schematic symbol kind of showing what an ideal capacitor looks like on a schematic versus, you know, maybe the symbol of all the parasitics. Now I showed ESL, ESL twice, just basically to remind myself to explain that ESL is kind of on each lead. It's the kind of accumulation and inductance throughout the part. And we just kind of can show it by showing it in one place. We don't have to show it twice. And same with ESR, it's kind of the accumulation of the, ES, uh, the series resistance. And this, is the leak, this represents the leakage current. So that's usually considered like, you know, mega ohms maybe. Different kind of caps leak more. So, you know, you can kind of simulate or think of it a, a real capacitor in these terms. Now, one thing I want to point out real quick is when you show straight blades like that, that's a non-polarized capacitor. That's non-electrolytic. Okay, Electrolytic should have a curved plate on the bottom and it should have a plus symbol showing the pause, the top. It should actually have both of those things. Sometimes you'll see just a curve, sometimes you'll see just a positive. But anyway, the straight ones, that's like a polycap or ceramic or something, okay? All right, guys, so what, what we can do is we can use a CEM DT9935 as an example. Uh, let me just stick this capacitor in here. It's an auto. Well, this meter has an auto mode to it, so you just see how it jumps up to the value. It says it's 18.4 microfarads. This is one kilohertz. And this, this D, if you can see that, that's the dissipation factor. Okay, so there's, there's what it looks like in the display. So that's the dissipation factor, okay. What I can do is I can, well, here, I can go to the function, and I can look at these other values. Okay, there's 2.4 ohms, a uh, 1 kilohertz, 2.4 ohms ESR. We can calculate that using that dissipation factor as well. All right, so then we can go here and we can uh, change it to 100 kilohertz. And look how the dissipation factor has changed. Oh, I'm sorry, that's 10 kilohertz. We are at 1, now it's 10. This next one's going to be 100. Look how the capacitance has dropped off and this dissipation factor has gone way up. Because this dissipation factor is a ratio between the X of C and the ESR. So it's equivalent to ESR divided by X of C is this number. So that's just a ratio there. Okay, then we can go to 100 hertz. And this capacitor, look, dissipation, it's gone back up to 22 mic. That's where it's rated. So you can tell this capacitor is meant for lower frequency uh, applications. Okay, what I'll do is I'll put two of these 10 microfarads in parallel. Remember, capacitors in parallel just add up. If you think about it, it makes sense. If you think about capacitors being two plates with some some uh, separation between two plates and if you put two in parallel it's like just making those plates longer by du you're doubling the length of those plates right so oops one of them is in there the other guy's not making contact let me get the other guy in there there we go okay let me zoom back down into the display so, all right, 100 hertz, 19.5. Look at that dissipation, 0 0.01. That's looking great. I think that's a factor of 10, right? Okay, do this function thing. Okay, that's 1.32 ohms ESR. Okay, that's 100 hertz. Let's go to 1K. Still 19.2, and look, it's gone up a little bit, 0.067, it's 
basically 0.07 if I go to 0.5 ohms ESR okay let's go to 10k Point three five ohms and look still 19.2 so up to 10 kilohertz it's looking like a pretty good capacitor 100k and it's dropped off a little bit and the D's gone up quite a bit so it's starting to roll off it's not looking as great as a capacitor let's do the ESR part and it's 0.35 ohms the ESR that doesn't look too bad right but the capacitance is rolled off so the ratio between the two has gone up so that's so the D has uh, so the D has gone up with that ratio change so yeah so there we go now here let me take you to the table where I've graphed things okay guys this is a table I made where I show the frequencies here 100 Hertz 1k 10k 100k this is from the CEM uh, LCR meter the DT 9935 so I've got the value of the capacitor here 22 mic cap and then I've got the 10 mic cap here and so the 22 mic cap what I did is I measured so I have measured and calculated for each one of these and what I measured at 100 Hertz was 22.3 microfarads I calculated that X to C using this formula here, X to C is equal to 1 or 2 pi FC. I calculated that using 100 hertz, 71.4 ohms. Okay, so over here, 18 microfarads calculates to 8.8, 15, so it's dropping, drop down to 15 microfarads at 10K, and calculate X to C 1.1. And here, look, it drops in half, 7.4 microfarads. So between here and here, the capacitance just drops way off on this. And even between here and here, it's dropped quite a bit, down to 15 microfarads. Okay? And that calculates a 0.22 ohms, X to C. Okay, now this number is the dissipation factor. So I call it, call it dissipation slash ESR, because this dissipation where I calculate uh, ESR, 10 ohms. So the dissipation factor is changing because the X to C is changing. And so you can kind of see it across the table here. Drop 10 ohms here, 2.65, 1, 7, and 1, 5. And in parentheses is what that meter measured, which is pretty much what I calculated. So the 10 mic fare, I just chose, this is a 22 mic, this is a 10 mic. So with the 10 mic fare, I... I got these numbers. I measured 9.7, 94, 92, 76. So again, it drops off here, but not near as much. Here we dropped half, but it had already dropped maybe 30% from here to here. And here we've stayed pretty solid, and then we've dropped about maybe 20%. So there's the X to C's. You can see for both values. Now the dissipation ESR for this one is uh, here so it's 3.3 quite a bit less than 10 1.35 and 0.9 so it looks much better and with two 10 microfarads in parallel down here I have measure 19.4 so essentially double what these measurements were the measured values here are just double now except for ESR. ESR it's half because you know capacitance you add capacitance two 10 mics make a 20 mic but the ESR you know two resistors in parallel is half so you can see that here in the parentheses here the ESR is half of those numbers the capacitance looks great just like up there and still 16 microfarads here compared to 15 at 10k here on on the 22 mic so two 10 mics are acting better than a 22 mic and the ESR is 0.33 up here is 1.6 so a lot better ESR too so the dissipation factor you know again it's ESR divided by X to C so it kind of changes as you go along so um, X to C 
when you make capacitor twice as big, it's half as small. And when you put two resistors in parallel, it's half as small. So this number went half and this number went half. So the dissipation numbers actually were the same here as they were for a 10 mic. So that's just kind of an interesting note. Now, you know, the, the break point, it's this ecstasy equals R, right? Which is equal to 1 or 2 pi FC. That's the ecstasy of formula. Now, but from here to here, it's easy to see how you get the RC, the RC time constant that's used often, 1 or 2 pi F. I just wanted to again point that out, but really what we're interested in is taking this equation here and changing it to this. We want to solve for F. So we cross multiply, get F up here, F divides out of there, and then, but we got to divide both sides by R, so we end up with R down here. So we end up with this equation right here, and that's where we find our break point or cutoff point or 3 dB point you know, corner frequency, all those names that we call up. And it's, it's a little bit less than 400 hertz, but I just rounded it up to 400 hertz to, you know, make the graphing easy. It was about 398, I think, is what the math came out to. All right, guys, so this is a setup for the RC filter. We have the resistor capacitor, the voltage from the generators going across the two. The input voltage is the the channel one and it's going across two it's in a 10x position the channel two is in 10x and it's looking across the capacitor so this would be the output so the output is going to get smaller and smaller with frequency so it's a low pass right and at low frequencies capacitor is going to be open and will look like we have all our voltage so we've already done this we're going to do this graph real quick and then what we're going to do is replace the 22 mic with the two 10 mics in parallel and graph that and see the difference okay okay so just to cover the setup of the scope I've got channel 2 that's the output coming in here and the input channel 1 so gain is going to be the output divided by the input so what I do is I on my channel 1 I've got on 10x and AC full bandwidth one meg so set that to 10x and voltage and channel 2 is going to be 10x and voltage and all those settings are good now the horizontal and the trigger I don't have to worry about because when I go to this app button um, it's already set up to run but if I because I've been running those, otherwise it would have came in to, came up with all these applications. And I come over to the FRA frequency response analysis, say select, and say yes, I want to do that. And I'm here. So now at this point, I just need to do a setup here. I'll bring you over to the scope and show you that. Hey guys, just realized I had a power supply running with a loud fan. Hopefully that wasn't too loud um, alright so what we do is outputs channel 2 inputs channel 1 uh, AWG cell set up 20 hertz to well it's not quite set up let's change this to 100 kilohertz we're gonna go out to 100k okay just so we can see what's going on out there and whoops didn't mean to do that Okay, so we're at 100K, amplitude's maxed out at 2 volts, and load impedance is, I'm going to go 50 ohms, that's low ohms, just so we can drive our capacitor. Alright, so I think that's all set up. Alright, so now at this point, I just have to hit um, run frequency, and let's scan that. So again, the frequency up here is changing as it's as it's scanning across, and down here it's showing the frequency it currently is at, and it's showing the gain phase where that 
frequency is currently at. And up here, if you look real close, you'll see the the horizontal time scale changing. You can't see it flipping here, but you can actually see it. It's like somebody's changing the horizontal time scale. And there's the curve. Okay, so from this curve, what you can see is the the gain in blue starts off close to zero. Okay, so I'm going to change this scale. Um, the gain phase, we're at 5 dB. I'm going to change it to, to minus 11. I'm going to change that to minus 10. So we get a zero over there. Okay, so now we you see we start off at zero and then at 400 hertz we're rolled off 3 dB. So that part is looking good, but instead of continuing on this way, it flattened out because of the ESR of the capacitor. So basically that's another break point. We could calculate that where that's happening. Now I'm going to change the phase, put a, a negative over here, uh, put a zero here. So let's go to, um, let's go to 30. Okay, because 15 degrees per, so now we have a zero here. So you can see it started off close to zero and then at 45, right around 400 hertz, See that line right there? It should have continued to 90, but it looked resistive again, so it went back to resistive. All right, so now let's try the uh, 210 mic caps and see what happens. All right, so I just have to hit, just have to hit run, and let's try it again. All right, it's looking kind of like, very similar, right? And that's with 210 mics. Now, the gain dropped all the way down um, below minus 32. Here, let's measure that. We'll put the cursors on there. Put those right down there. So that's minus uh, 35 dBs and it started off essentially zero. Now I could put cursor one at 400 hertz. Now it's kind of jumping between those two. It's kind of hard to see it, but you can see the uh, is minus 47 at 460. So the phase shift. So now it did drop a little farther down. It came. This is minus 69 here. It was headed to minus 90, but then again, the ESR even of those uh, better, you know, having the two caps made it better, but still it ended up going looking resistive. So if we only cared about frequencies up to a couple kilohertz, you know, it would have looked like we wanted it. Okay, let's take the impedance curve of just the 22 microfarad by itself. Let's just see what that looks like all by itself. Okay, so let's go ahead and start this. I, I've started this over. Um, kind of made a mistake with the camera. So here we go. Okay, now if you notice the phase, the red, it's about minus 90 here, so we should be minus 90 if it was a perfect capacitor. Just look like minus 90, and see how the gain's dropping? That would just continue to drop all the way through the curve. Okay, now that here the phase starts to change. So it looked like a capacitor, and then it started going to look like a resistor. So if we went up to about 45 uh, degree change, or 3 dB point, it almost looked like it rolled off around, I don't know, 2 or 3 kilohertz maybe. Or maybe that's 4 kilohertz. This is 2, 3, 4 K. Maybe around 4 kilohertz. Now it's interesting that it, it as a resistor, it didn't just... It, it, 
didn't continue going up, but it actually started dropping again. And actually, this impedance curve started dropping a little bit. Not sure about that. That's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting part of the graph. Okay, let's try the two 10 mic caps. Now, what I would expect of the two 10 mic caps is that it's going to drop a little bit further. It's going to come a little higher frequency before this happens. But essentially, it'll end up looking similar to this at some point. Now, the other thing is this dropped down to about, um, I don't know, 5 dBs. Started off around up here. Here, let's measure that. Okay, so that's where it started. I put this guy here. Okay, let's see. It's 20 dB, and I'd say it started rolling off. I don't know, somewhere around there. I'd, I'd plot some somewhere around there. So it started off about 48 dB, and ended up about 7.4 right here where it started flattening off so about 7.4 I'd expect the 210 mics drop a little bit further than that and hopefully out here a little higher frequency so let's see what happens all right so let's try the 210 mics All right, it's looking like minus 90 dB, or, or the, oh, there, and there's changing. All right, so that was kind of interesting. Um, this, these caps in parallel continue to kind of ramp down, but they, they did kind of take a bend here, and then the slope looks like it's changed a little bit, but they look like they're still kind of continuing, but the phase did change. It was minus 90. This scale auto changes, okay? So this, this curve looks a lot like the last one, but when you look at the numbers here, they're really different because 45 degrees is way up here. So it's actually out here where um, it started to change. So you can tell from the phase, the 45 degrees, that didn't occur until out here now it's, it's just that this thing auto scales so it makes it kind of look like the last picture here let's put up the measurement the cursors now they just go to the same spot they were last time so we can just compare those numbers so we're down at 40 B and I believe we were up about double that on the last one so it's dropped down to 4 and the um, the phase is still minus 75 at that point. So see, we're at minus 90. So we're we're still we did improve because you'd have to come out here further. I would say probably out to 45. You know, maybe out to 20 kilohertz. Okay, so if I want to plot these three points convert them from DB to resistance I have 40 or 50.21 here and 4.23 here and over here looks like about minus 11 so that's what I get I get about 324 ohms for the first spot 1.63 for the next and about 282 milliohms for the final spot whoops and and to get those, all I do is say, for instance, take the minus 11 dB. I go 11, chain sign, enter. So it's minus 11 dB. So I t divide that by 20. And then take the anti-log, which is 10 over X. And that's 282 milli ohms. Okay, guys, we're going to go ahead and start this scan. This is of the 1 microfarad uh, polycap which 
looks like that. Big old one mic poly cap. These are safety rated caps, X2 cap, that's why it's so big. So, wow. All right, the phase is about minus 90. It actually started off a little bit lower than that, it looks like. So, and then it, right here, you see the capacitance just dropping off. And then right here, this resonant point, that frequency there, which is about, here, let's turn on the measurement, guys. Measure, cursor's on. Okay, I had it up there before when I ran this, so um, there we go. We got the cursor right there at um, 45.85 dBs. Okay, and it's about 90 degrees, uh, minus 90 there. So, um, and that's right there, minus 90. So, it's coming off across here, then it, inductive reactance equals capacitive reactance there, so we get a resonant point. And it's not too sharp. Sometimes you'll see it go down pretty deep, then come up really inductive. But I think we're also kind of hitting the point where we have the ESR, uh, at the ESR level, which is about 5 milliohms. So, because this, if you do the math on that, let me get my calculator again. Yeah, so if you, if you do the math on minus 45.85, you get about 5 milliohms. You know, it's kind of hitting the ESR of the cap, which keeps it from dropping too low. And then if the inductance kicked in around here, if there's more inductance, Inductance is pretty low on these caps, but if it's higher, you see a little bigger dip, you know. But that's what we see, and then it kind of comes up. Now, if there's more inductance, you'd see it continue up like this. That's a little bit, you know, that's out there at 820 kilohertz, almost, you know, out there close to megahertz. And then, you know, you see the phase going positive when this happens. All right, I hope that was interesting to see that guy. All right, so hey, I hope that was helpful. I think we're kind of done with this RC stuff for now. We're gonna get into LC filters. We're gonna, I got a speaker crossover that I'm going to demonstrate, and that'll kind of be, that, that'll really show uh, filters, which is great for power supply filtering, EMI filtering, the output filtering, audio filtering, so, you know, a speaker crossover is actually really interesting to look at. Uh, it brings up a lot of good points. And so we'll do that. Um, but so plotting, remember, your pass bands are voltage is equal to uh, V out is equal to VN. That's your pass band. Not exactly equal, but pretty close. So when V out divided by VN is equal to one, that the log of that is zero. So you get a zero dB point. So your pass band, you can plot zero dB. And then you make, you find out your formula where X of C is equal to R, or if you have an inductor and a resistor, your X of L is equal to R. You find that spot and you um, plot a point there, okay? And that's your three dB point. And then your 20 dB per decade off, okay? Depending on the situation of your R, and your C or your R and your L, you you know you'll roll off either you'll either have a high pass or a low pass. Okay. Um, all right. So um, so the important parts is the you start off at zero dB, you break it your three dB point, which is also called the cutoff frequency or the break point, or you know it's known by several names, right? Um, but then after that with a single order where you only have a capacitor and a resistor if you have a capacitor and inductor it's two orders then you roll off at 40 dB so see it's getting pretty easy right and um, and you know the parasitics can kind of ruin that perfect curve right um, so when we're choosing our capacitors or our inductors or resistors for these filters we got to make sure that their parasitics aren't messing up you know our roll-off frequencies. Um, you, we got to make sure their parasitics are outside the band that we care about. All right. So, 
I think we saw the importance of parasitics. And what we'll do, like if you don't have a scope that's going to do this curve for you, make it easy, you know, like I'm kind of feel like I'm cheating using a scope like this. There's uh, manual techniques, you know, you can use a meter, right? You can plot points that way. Uh, but there's another way you can use your scope to do this and I'll demonstrate that in a short video just to show uh, maybe two or three different ways to do it, okay? Alright, hey, thanks for watching guys. Uh, see you next time.